So we're going through a chronological study of the Gospels. We've been doing this for a while now, and we will continue to do so. It's going to take us a while to get through the Gospels. You've got to figure we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, it's the life of Christ, and there's so much that we have learned from it. There's so much yet to learn from it. We've spent a decent amount of time in John chapter number 4. In fact, for the last three weeks, we've been in John chapter number 4. And as we have walked through an understanding of what it looks like whenever Jesus has a divine appointment with the woman at the well, and we realize that, that God many times wants to take us to divine appointments as well, but we can, be, we can be quick sometimes to be like the disciples. Our stomachs are growling. We've got other things on our minds. And so instead of being there and seeing that divine opportunity, we are off doing something else. And so we need to be attentive to what God is doing around us. We need to be willing to say, why did God bring me here? Here. Why did God bring me to this place, to this person, to these people? Why does God have me in this family? Why does God, and we need to be quick to say, okay, what is it, God, that you want me to do here? How is it that I need to be attentive to you? And so we've been looking at that for the last few weeks as we got towards the end of John chapter number four. Uh, that was last week. We, we were looking and we, we said, listen, we have to be careful that Jesus doesn't become casual to us. You remember that Jesus, as he goes back to his hometown, says a prophet has no honor in his own country. And we looked at the fact that Jesus would have grown up there. They would have looked at him as just another one of the guys. Oh yeah, that's, that's Jesus from Nazareth. I grew up with him. There's nothing special about him, trust me. In fact, you heard about his birth. You hear about all, how all that happened. I mean, they're talking about you know it being some special thing. But quite honestly, I think Mary and Joseph just probably slept together. And so we've got this illegitimate child there. And so they looked at Jesus, and when he would go back to his hometown, there, there, there was a lot of times that he wouldn't have been looked at as anyone special. Now, the interesting thing is he had gone to Jerusalem already, and many of the people had seen what he had done there, and they're like, there's something special. And so you remember that the royal official comes back uh, from Capernaum, uh, which is about 20 miles away, comes to Jesus and says, my son is sick. My son is sick and he needs healed. And you'll remember that whenever Jesus started dialoguing with him, he says this. He says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you'll never believe. But the interesting thing we saw last week was this. The royal official took Jesus at his word. When Jesus said, your son will be healed, you know what he did? Without seeing any proof, without seeing anything special... He left and he went back home and his son was healed and our faith needs to be like that. And so the question became, in addition to the, the first point, which is being careful we don't become casual with Jesus and viewing him kind of like his people from his hometown did. The second thing was, will you respond to something other than the miraculous? Sometimes the ordinary is actually extraordinary. The fact that God has allowed you to wake up and to have breath today is extraordinary. The fact that God allowed you to be born in the United States of America is extraordinary. The fact that you can come to a place and worship the Lord without freedom, without fear of any persecution, it's extraordinary. The fact that daily you can lean on Jesus is extraordinary. Do you realize the access you have to the creator of the universe, the sustainer of life, do you realize that when you wake up in the morning and you say, Lord, thank you for another day, being able to have that access is extraordinary. It seems ordinary to you, but it's extraordinary. So we come to today, and we're going to finally be on, out of John chapter number 4, and we're going to be in Luke chapter number 5 together. Before we're in Luke 5, we're going to be in Matthew 4 and Mark 1. Uh, this is one of those passages that's a parallel passage in what we would call the synoptic gospels. You'll remember the synoptic gospels 
our Gospels that say largely the same thing. You have Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic Gospels. And then you have the Gospel of John, which hits on a lot of things that the synoptic Gospels don't hit on. And so in this instance, what we're going to look at today, what's probably labeled in your Bible as the calling of the first disciples, you're going to find it in Matthew, you're going to find it in Mark, you're going to find it in Luke. We're going to settle in on Luke, but we're going to start in Matthew, because what I want you to see is how the Gospels, they might be slightly different at times, and yet they provide a more complete and a more accurate story. And so let's just, uh, let's just here in a moment go into that. But before we do that, I want to kind of walk you through where we've been so that we can kind of understand, you know, I've talked about Jesus going from this place to that place and back to this place. Let's just kind of show on the screen, first miracle was where? It was in Cana of Galilee, right? And so I kind of have that circled for you. Uh, after he was in Cana of Galilee, he went over to Capernaum. And you'll, you'll read about this in John chapter number 2. Is it coming up clear? Oh, it is. Good, good, good. It's kind of hard to read the small towns, so I'll, I'll say them whenever he goes there. And so he goes over to Capernaum. And then after he's in Capernaum, you remember he goes to Jerusalem. And whenever he's in Jerusalem, we find him there at the Passover. And he goes in and he throws over the money changers' tables, right? And, and so you find him there in Jerusalem. After he's in Jerusalem, he goes into Judea and he ministers there for a, a period of time. And you'll remember that as he ministers there, some of John's disciples, they're like, hey, listen, um, they say to John, do, do you realize that some of your disciples are now starting to follow Jesus? And you remember what, 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 what John says, he must increase, I must decrease. This is the way that it's supposed to be. I'm his forerunner. And so they minister kind of in the same area for a period of time. And so you have Jesus in the Judean countryside. Well, he wants to go back to Galilee. And you'll remember that as he, goes, as he wants to go back to Galilee, he could have gone around Samaria, but he doesn't do that because God has a divine appointment for him with the woman at, well, at the well there at Sychar. And so you have him going to Sychar, meeting with the woman at the well. Well, after he's there with the woman at the well, you remember he goes back into Galilee. And he goes back, it says, to Cana, where he had performed his first miracle. Well, today we get him where right beside the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee also called the Lake of Gennesaret. So depending on which version of the Bible you have, uh, you might see either Lake of Gennesaret or you might see the Sea of Galilee. And so we find Jesus going over there. And then right after we find Jesus going there, we're going to see him go back to Capernaum for a little while. So that at least gives you a little bit of a visual when I'm talking about him going from this place to that place. You kind of get a little picture on a map here just to, just to the east of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, this is where all of these events are taking place. All right, so uh, Matthew chapter number four. Matthew chapter number four. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn there. We're going to read just a few verses together, starting in verse number 18. Matthew chapter number four, verse number 18. Now, what I want to do is, what I want to do is kind of read these three passages. First two passages are going to sound extraordinarily similar. In fact, you might think that I just like transposed uh, Mark for Matthew because they are so similar. But they are, they are the accounts in each of the Gospels. Matthew and Mark are going to seem similar. Luke is going to provide more detail. Now, just by providing more detail doesn't mean the other uh, accounts aren't accurate. I was thinking about this. Uh, for anyone who went to homecoming uh, either last week or if your school had it, uh, uh, or last night or if your school had it a previous week, if you went to homecoming and you asked someone, maybe let's say, let's say you asked three people, what happened at homecoming? How many of you think by asking three different people what happened at homecoming, you're going to get the exact same account? In fact, most likely if you ask one person at 8 o'clock in the morning what happened at homecoming, then you ask them again at 10 o'clock in the morning, then you ask them again at noon, you'll get three different accounts of what happened at homecoming. Because it is not as if there is just this small amount of information. You have to realize that as the disciples are walking with Jesus, they're experiencing a lot and they're taking in a lot. And they're then recounting uh, in the Gospels, we're seeing some of what had happened. So, so, so just as you get more detail, don't think, oh man, 
well that's not what Matthew said or that's not what Mark said well why does Luke say something different than what Matthew or Mark said well Luke is going to say something quote unquote different it's actually just a more expansive part of the story okay he just provides more details so I don't want you to get wrapped up in thinking oh okay well why are they slightly different all right let's start with Matthew chapter number four verse number 18 as Jesus was walking beside the sea of Galilee he saw two brothers Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew I want to pause for a moment I should have said this earlier if you remember maybe eight weeks ago possibly 10 or 12 weeks ago I don't expect you to remember that far back but if you remember you might remember like hey I thought I thought when we were in the first chapter of John I thought Jesus already met some of his disciples didn't we read a passage about Jesus seeing Andrew and then Andrew going and finding his brother Peter and bringing him to Jesus and saying we found the Messiah and then the next day didn't Jesus find Philip and then Philip goes and finds Nathaniel like okay so if we are chronologically doing this how is it that we're just now getting to the calling of the saint, the first disciples and you just said Simon Peter's name and I could have swore that in John chapter number one we already met Peter well I'm glad you remembered that far back and, and like had that question because I knew you would and so I wanted to go ahead and address that okay so so the first time whenever he meets Peter and Andrew and Philip and Nathaniel and we think John too uh, John's the one writing about it and he doesn't specifically mention himself he just says that there was another person and most likely it is John so whenever he first meets them and this would have been all the way back before even he performs the first miracle at Cana and Galilee you remember because he takes the disciples there with him uh, all the way back then that, that was an introduction but but pretty much all biblical scholars would would agree that they didn't just follow Jesus every day from that per, that from that point forward that was an introduction and they did follow him and you'll find times that they are with him but now Jesus is going to give them a specific call okay so before we got into that I wanted to just since you were all going to ask that question I wanted to address it they met Jesus earlier now he's going to call them to be his disciples all right so we're in verse number 18 jesus is walking beside the sea of galilee he sees two brothers simon called peter and his brother andrew already knew them because he met them way back when they were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen here's the call verse number 19 come follow me jesus said and i will make you fishers of men at once they left their nets and followed him verse 21 going on from there he saw two other brothers James the son of Zebedee and his brother John they were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets and Jesus called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him simple enough to understand right flip over in your Bibles to Mark chapter number one Mark chapter number one so we're just going Matthew and then over to the book of Mark Mark chapter number one and in Mark chapter number 1, starting in verse number 16, we read this. It says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. You say, didn't we just read that? Well, yeah, kind of we did. It was in Matthew. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and they followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. Flip over in your Bibles to Luke chapter number 5. Again, we're going parallel passages here. Luke chapter number 5, verses 1 through 11. Now, previously we read verses 16 through 20, and... Uh, now we're getting 1 through 11, so already a little bit more understanding that we're getting more detail. Starting in verse number 1 of Luke, chapter number 5, we read this. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, again, lake of Gennesaret, same as the Sea of Galilee, just a different name for it, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So now we get a little bit more detail. Why was he there? 
He was there because he was actually teaching a crowd of people. There were people who routinely were seeking to learn from Jesus. In fact, if you would remember back to John 1, when we first met Peter, Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, and John, when we first met them and they first met Jesus, you remember they wanted to spend the day with him, learning from him. And a lot of Jesus' followers wanted to learn from him as well. And so we get the additional detail that Jesus wasn't just on some random walk. He was actually there, and he had a crowd of people that he was teaching. So he's with a crowd of people around him. They're listening to the word of God. Verse number two, he saw at the water's edge two boats that were left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Now, we already got the information that they were washing their nets earlier. Now we get the information, okay, Jesus is teaching. Uh, he sees the two boats. They're with their nets. We already know that. What's going to happen as a result of that? He got into one of the two boats the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. I've told you before, I'm a visual person. I like to, whenever I read the word of God, think, what would that look like? So if you can kind of picture this, I mean, it's a pretty neat experience, I think, right? And so they're there, and they're following Jesus. They're seeking to learn from him. And maybe they're crowded around in such a way that it's hard for him to communicate well. And so he just goes out a little ways in the boat. He sits down and he teaches them from a boat. That's, pretty, that's a pretty cool little thing there. Um, if you can kind of imagine that taking place and they're just seeking to learn from him. Well, continuing on in verse number four, it says, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, now it's interesting that he already uses the word master. Why would he already use the word master? You remember back to John chapter number one. He wanted to learn from Jesus. He had spent the day learning from him there. At this point, he has realized there's something special about Jesus. And he says, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. This is my fishing trips right there. I've been here all day. And I haven't caught anything. How many of you is that? That's your general fishing experience. Anyone other than me? All right, I see one, two, okay, three. Okay, so, so a decent number of hands. Good. I, I'm not the only one that is terrible at fishing. I've had people that try, I can teach you how to fish. I'm like, I'll tell you what I need. I need one of those fish finders. <laughs> you ever played a video game with like, fishing now i don't even know if they make them anymore but they used to have these video games where they would tell you how deep the fish was you know on the video game and you've got to kind of get the get the the bait drop down there and it's like okay you know i'm gonna get this fish i need something that'll tell me how deep the fish is what the fish like what mood they're in you know uh that way i know what kind of food they want uh you know what the favorite thing is that's what i need in order i don't need you to teach me how to fish I need a fish finder that tells me how deep the fish is. They had fished all night. They hadn't caught anything. I would guess this wasn't their normal experience. They wouldn't have been able to stay fishermen if it was their normal experience. But this night, they hadn't caught anything. Here, check this out. The middle part of verse number five. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Jesus says in verse 4, put out into the deep water, let down the nets for a catch. Peter says, we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. There is a lot of power and a lot of truth right there in those five words. But because you say so. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to seem logical to the people around you. It doesn't have to seem logical to your own mind. But because you say so, I'll do it. I'll let down the nets. You got to wonder what Peter was thinking. Do you think that he was thinking, all right, I'll let down the nets and I'm going to catch a ton of fish. Or do you think he was saying, I'm not about to tell you no. 
So I'll drop them down, we'll pull them back up, and we'll go on into shore not having caught anything again. We don't know. We don't know what Peter's mindset was whenever he dropped those nets. But the reality was this. He said this. Because you say so, I'll go ahead and do it. Well, continuing on, it says in verse number 6, When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Now, you have to remind yourself they did this for a living. You do find them mending their nets at other times as well. And so it's not as if their nets had never broken. But you got to figure that they probably had their nets constructed in such a way that on a typical basis, on a typical catch, their nets held up. Well, this time they didn't. Their nets began to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. Then they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. <laughs> they began to sink. That's awesome. Trust me when I say I've never had anywhere near that many fish in my boat. <laughs> I would guess most of you, the only time I've seen anything close to that, you ever watch swamp people? <laughs> and they're like pulling in these alligators like, I mean, they've got these 13 feet long alligators and, and I'm like, okay, well that's starting to weigh down the boat. But on a typical catch of fish, you're not having that happen. It says in verse number eight, when Simon Peter saw this, check out what he did. He fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Oh, we already, we read the condensed version that James and John were there. But they saw this happening too. They were Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Just as we read in Matthew and in Mark that Jesus says, come, I'll make you fishers of men. He says, now I tell you what, I'll make you catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything and they followed him. I want you to see just basically two things this morning. Two things this morning. The first one is this, and I already mentioned it. It's kind of a question. Will you respond to Jesus in spite of your instincts? Will you respond to Jesus in spite of your instincts? Our ways are not His ways. Our thoughts are not His thoughts. And oftentimes what he calls us to do, it's going to go against our natural grain, the direction we would choose to naturally go. I mean, you think about this for a moment. There are kind people in this world. There really are. There are people who will help others, even though they aren't followers of Christ. That, that, that for some people, it happens. But for followers of Christ, that ought to be the norm. Our instincts ought to have changed from thinking only of self to thinking of others. When He changes our hearts and He changes our eternity, He changes our mindset as well. We don't any longer see things only from a human point of view. We see things, and there's so many recurring themes that it's just like, oh, yeah, we, 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 we talked about that before. The eternal perspective. The eternal perspective. We talked about it back in Hebrews. It, it goes all the way through every fiber of our being, this eternal perspective. Will you follow Jesus, and will you respond to him in spite of your instincts? The interesting thing is, and the reason I brought up John 1 earlier, is that in John 1, they were introduced to Jesus. In John 1, they, they learned from Jesus. It says that they spent the day with him. And, and you get the, the picture that they don't only spend the day, but the very next day they're with him. And then whenever he travels to Canaan and Galilee, they're with him then too. Okay, but, but then there had come a time whenever they had gone back to being fishermen. 
whether it meant they needed some money to pay their bills, whether they needed to be able to help their father out, they had gone back. Their instincts would have taken them back. That would have been what they had been called to do to that point. That was their livelihood. But then Jesus comes along and he calls them to a greater purpose. There's no indication that these men were th just even use, using the word men, the, the indication is not that they're 13, 14 years old just starting out in life. Doesn't seem to be that they are just you know, young people here. They're established with their father in this business. And Jesus comes along and he presents them something different. And they follow him. Will you respond to Jesus despite your instincts? Even if you go to just the one specific instance where Peter says, I've fished all night long. We've been dropping our nets. In fact, Jesus, like, we've covered this whole area. Uh, any, any hunters in here? Like, okay, there's, there's only three hunters? All right. I know there's more hunters in here than that guys just don't know how to raise your hands or something i don't know uh, anyway you ever hunted an area and you're like all right we have hunted this area there's nothing there whether it be a uh, uh a row of uh briars that you're hunting rabbits in uh or whether it's a field you're hunting pheasants in or whether it's uh hunting a a section of wood for deer you're like i've walked through there I've already checked that. I can remember times growing up that, you know, you're walking along in the woods, and a lot of times it was me, my dad, and my brother hunting rabbits, and you're walking along the hillside, you're kicking this pile of brush, you know, and you walk around, you kick it from a different angle, and then dad comes along, and he decides he's going to step in the middle, you know, he's going to get all the way up in, and sure enough, out come, something goes. You, yeah, dad, I've, I've already kicked that. I kicked it from both sides. Well, just let me see if there's anything in there, and oh, man, you know, Peter's probably at this point thinking all of my instincts say we fished this whole area. We haven't caught anything, but he was a willing to listen to Jesus despite his instincts. And he dropped the nets. Now, here's the other thing that I want us to see. Check this out. And I actually didn't even notice this until this. I, there's so many times that I'm like, I've never seen that before. Or I've never thought about that angle before. Verse number seven. After they dropped the nets. They caught, verse 6, such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. They signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. They had never been so prosperous in their career before. They, they were at the height of having caught so many fish, their boat is sinking. You know, what, you know what I would do? As a, I, I have a little bit of a business mind. You know what I would do at that point? I'd ask Jesus to become my partner in fishing. That's what I would think would be a logical thing. Hey, Jesus, you know, um, these people, after you teach them, probably all going to go away for a little while. Maybe they'll come back tomorrow. Uh, we're going to fish all night again. I'm thinking if we caught this many fish with one time dropping the nets, you'd just be our own fish finder. Like, you tell me where to drop the net. I'll drop the net. We're going to have quite the business here. That's the way I would think. Anybody else that would think kind of that way? Like, you, you find something that is like, wow, this is a really good angle. Wow, I can make a lot of money doing this. Like, I'm just going to, here we go. And then you're, you just boom, 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 boom. And it's just one thing after another. It's like, okay, here we go. At the height of them being the most prosperous they've ever been. Jesus says, I'll make you fishers of men. And they drop everything, and they follow him. And, and, and I, I, I'm asking the question of myself, and I'm asking you, will you, despite your best instincts, respond to the call of God on your life? Here's the reality. I believe 
God wants every one of you to be a fisher of men. And if we want to be politically correct or whatever, a fisher of people. When we're talking about men, we're not talking about men as in just men. We're talking about people, okay? It's my belief that God has a call upon every one of your lives to be a fisher of people, a fisher of men. I believe that he wants to change not necessarily your career. And, and far be it for me to say that God won't come to you and say, you know what, and, and it has happened over and over and over again. The number of people that God has called, whether it be to the mission field, whether it be to the pastorate, whether it be to youth ministry, whatever, but God does that. He has a way of doing that, but he doesn't, that's not his specific call on everyone's life to be in ministry full-time. It's just not, and, and that's okay. But, but his call to be ministers of the gospel, to be those who preach the message of reconciliation at your workplaces, in your homes, with your circle of friends, he is calling you to a higher purpose. I used to say this, and I stopped saying it because I didn't want people to like take it the wrong way, but I'm going to say it again, hopefully with the right explanation. Students, your purpose in going to school is not only to get an education, okay? You don't go there with that singular mindset. You go there as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ to get an education in the meantime, and you should focus on that ed education. Yes, you should. You should do your very best. Yes, you should. But you should go into your school every day with the mindset of this. God, who do you want me to minister to today? God, who are you going to bring divinely into my path that I can show compassion to? Who are you going to bring me to that I can share the message of Jesus with? And all of you parents that are saying, I, amen, I, I agree. Or some of you might be saying, no, I only want them focusing on their education. They can only focus on one thing at a time. And they can't focus on being ministers of the gospel and focus on their education. They'll get all messed up. Well, listen, the highest purpose is being a minister of the gospel. Whenever you are a minister of the gospel and then whenever you realize God's purposes for your, your life, you know what you do? You do everything to the best of your ability because that's what God calls you to do. Sometimes we focus on the lower things thinking that'll fix everything else. So like, you got to focus on your schoolwork. No, you need to focus that Jesus calls you to always do your best. And if he always calls you to do your best, you know what will fall in line? It should, and I talked pretty directly to the teenagers this last Sunday. I was a little hard on them. I'm like, I'm tired of teach. I didn't say it this way. Tired of teaching you, not seeing you want to line up with God's word. The weirdest thing I've ever experienced in my life. All right, so from 2000 to 2003, I was in Ashland. Uh, from 2003, the, the middle part of it, until 2016, the, well, the end part of 2015, I was in central Pennsylvania. In both churches talk to teenagers preach to teenagers teach to teenagers they're like okay yeah god says it all right we're gonna line up that's what we're gonna do this is the first place i've ever been where the adults so props to you adults the adults are more willing to change than teenagers normally teenagers are like all right you know i'm not setting my ways totally i mean i know it all but um I, i'm not totally setting my ways hey i once knew it all too i really did there was a time in my life i knew it all and then i got older and realized it didn't um but like adults like so often i hear just this past week again uh, another phone call actually multiple phone calls like hey god was teaching me this and i realized i got to do this and it's like oh that's awesome and so i say to say to the teenagers this past Sunday, like listen you've got to get to the point where if god says it that's just what you do you don't question it. And so back to what I was saying earlier with you parents to kind of ease your minds a little bit. If you teach the higher level, listen, you've got to give yourself fully to Jesus. What should naturally come as a result is them giving their best in every area of life. That's a byproduct of it. But if you only deal with the byproduct, you might miss the more superior thing. And so we send our children, we send our students, we send our teenagers into school as ministers of the gospel to get an education. Now, I'm not leaving the adults off the hook either. You are not at your workplace to get a paycheck. You're just not. 
You are there as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in the process of being a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are performing your work. Now, whenever you deal with the highest level things, which is, I am going to follow Jesus with all of my heart, you know what you're going to do? You're going to do a superior job at your, at your workplace. It just is going to go, you, we've got to go to these higher level that affects everything beneath rather than trying to deal with the symptoms. So often we try to deal with symptoms and really we need to deal with the highest level, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And whenever you do that and you say, okay, God says it, that's what I do. It changes every part of who we are. So they were never more prosperous. And yet when Jesus says, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Despite probably their best instincts. And they follow Jesus. Will you? Really just two questions today. Despite your best instincts, will you respond to the call of Jesus on your life? Second question, will you be a fisher of men? Will the gospel become a priority? Will you, in your interactions, start sharing the gospel? I forget who I was talking to recently, and uh, whoever I was talking to, they're like, you know, it's, it's not the same people at uh, the West Salem IGA that I used to remember. I'm like, oh, man. Most of the people at the West Salem IGA, as you check out, they've been the same since I've been around. Uh, you go there in the evening, and John's going to be there. You go there in the morning, and I can't. What's the blonde-haired lady's name? Anybody know her name? Nobody know her name? No? She's always there, too. Um, and so our family, we, buy, we don't buy most of our groceries at the IGA, but like we make specific attempts to go into the IGA to interact with people. It just makes sense. Like, that's the community we live in. Why would you not interact with the people? And so, like, John and I, like, we just enjoy uh, having interaction there. And it's like, okay, are you going to use these opportunities, Dave, to be able to share the gospel? And so, sure enough, I mean, the conversation is bound to come up, and it has. Like, hey, what is it that you do? You know what? I'm a pastor. Where do you pastor a church? Uh, here's where it is. Why don't you come sometime, John? I haven't gotten him here yet, but Lord willing, I will. You guys can work on John, too. How many of you in here know John? Well, yeah, you've got to know John. You work there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so start working on John. Let's see if we can get him here. When we think about trunk or treat, I'll be honest with you. I like having, like, letting kids have a good time, but trunk or treat is not about kids having a good time. It's about introducing people to the love of Christ so that ultimately we can share with them the gospel. If all we do is let kids have a good time, we failed. But if we can introduce people to the, 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 the one who has changed our lives, who has changed our eternity, who has changed our purpose, and then they can come to know Christ as well, I'll tell you what, there's very few things I wouldn't do. There just aren't, like... To be able to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's got to be of, of the utmost importance. So, two questions. Will you respond to Jesus despite your best instincts? And the second, will you be a fisher of men? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the clarity of it. Thank you for uh, Simon and his brother Andrew. Uh, thank you, Lord, that as you called them, uh, that they, they followed you. Lord, thank you for James and for John, that whenever you called them, they followed you. And sometimes success can be a hindrance to, to us following you. Sometimes the more prosperous we are, the more time we take for ourselves, the more prosperous we are, the, the more we think about ourselves and the less we think about you. And so I pray that you help our minds and our hearts always to be in tune with what are you calling us to do? What's your call upon my life, Lord? What's your call upon these students' lives? What's your call upon these adults? Lord, we know that you want us to be ministers of the gospel of reconciliation, telling others that there's a God who loves them so much that he sent his one and only begotten son to this earth. Not to condemn the world. The world already stands condemned 
but to give life through your son. So, Lord, I pray if there's anyone in here today that doesn't know you as their Savior, that today would be the day that your Holy Spirit convicts their heart and says, I, I need a Savior. For those that already know you, Lord, I pray that today is a day where they say, you know what? I've been living a lot of my life going to work to get a paycheck. Not realizing that I'm actually supposed to go to work to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in the process of being a minister of the gospel, I am to get a paycheck. For these students who have spent their, their lives thinking, I, I'm supposed to go to school to get an education, I pray that you would change their mindset that they are to go to school to be a minister of the gospel and in the process to get a great education. May this change our mindset despite our best instincts. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.